I see a lot of uh, Eagles jerseys in the room today, and I want to invite you to uh, find another church, and <laughs> there's lots of good ones out there, you know. N not, not every church is for everyone, you know. You've got to find the one that God has called you to. Are there any Chiefs fans in this room? Any Chiefs fans? few of you? A any Eagles fans in this room? I know. I know. The whole Presley family, Eagles fans. <laughs> They're such wonderful people. You know, that's really why you need the body of Christ, to show you your blind spots, to show you where you're in sin and in error. And so, you know, uh, I'm just, you guys are just like, hey, my team's in it, right? So, um, you know, speaking of team, I want to talk with you about the greatest team God ever made outside of you and him, which is you and your spouse if you're married here today. Come on, can I hear it up for the married folks? If you're in a dating relationship, um, I, this, this applies to you. If you're thinking about ever wanting to be married, this still applies to you. So I don't want you to turn to now. Last week, uh, we started this series. We're going to continue it this week. Next week, Pastor Amy's going to join me. And uh, finally, the following week, we're going to have some veterans. Uh, Amy and I have been married 21 years, but there's some folks in the room that have been married a lot longer than us um, who have some wisdom that they'll impart to you. So the next two weeks, you really don't want to miss. Um, I believe they're going to be meaningful and valuable for you in your marriage. But um, I, I want to just give you some principles, and then we're going we're gonna to look at what the Word of God says and how the Word enforces these principles. And I think a lot of times, you know, growing up in church there, I was taught about marriage, but I wasn't necessarily told um, the, the difficult things about marriage, the hard things that, that, that I would encounter in marriage. And my parents were awesome. I mean, they preached the Word of God, taught the Word of God. They, they, they're, they're great models, examples. They didn't get it right all the time. They let us see that in, in a godly way and um, showed us how to make it work even when it wasn't working. Anybody? Have you ever had to make it work when it won't work in? Oh, we got a bunch of religious people up in here. Okay, you don't want to raise your hand. It's okay. It's cool. It's cool. It's just me. It's just me. I'm the, I'm the only one that needs you, Lord. Uh, but but, but I, we, had to, we had to learn how to make it work when it wasn't working. And um, I think that there's some principles that, that'll help you in here. And the first one that I want to tell you is there will be times when you fight harder for it than they do. Okay? I just want to lay that on you. There will be times when you fight harder for it than they do. And you don't need to keep score on it. Right? There is no scoreboard in the kingdom. Any competitive people out there? You know, you like, I, I, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no score in marriage. It's a race to the back of the line. So, so let me say this. The design of marriage should reflect shared effort, shared commitment, and shared responsibility. Remember, it was all about Jesus and his church from the beginning. The devotion of marriage is to pull the weight whether someone else does or not. No amens. I got you. I got you. I know. It's tough. Hear me now. The design, how God designed marriage, is that it should reflect shared effort, shared commitment, and shared responsibility. The devotion of marriage is to pull the weight whether someone else does or not. Design and devotion. Have you ever noticed that what God allows isn't always what he intended? We're getting in the deep end of the pool right off the bat, aren't we? Sorry. But, but, but the reality is there will be some times, and Amy can testify to this, where I looked nothing like Jesus in our marriage. And, and sometimes she literally said, get behind me, Satan. This is not the will of the Lord. There will simply be times when you fight harder. Happy couples know how to put each other first by going first in an effort to be last. By being first in an effort to be last. Kind of that race to the back of the line thing. Are you hearing me out there? And, and, and so, so what I've noticed, particularly if you've been in a relationship, because right now there's a lot of the American church that has gone through divorce and there's no, there's no condemnation in any of that. I want you to hear me right out from the gate. But 
But, but a lot of times we get out of something only to try and reach to get in something quickly, right? Because we know that there's a void. People typically don't rush into a new relationship because they're eager to give their lives to someone, right? Just putting that out there. People don't get into new relationships because they just want to fulfill the hopes and the dreams and the desires of the other person. Typically, they're looking for someone to fulfill their hopes and dreams and desires. Those other people, by the way, are always on their best behavior. Did you ever notice that after you got married? I know I lost some etiquette. Amy's like, mm -hmm, door, thank you. We don't rush into new relationships so we can be selfless with someone new. Usually when we're in a rush, it's because we're trying to fill a void. Okay? And so I want to tell you, there's some things that God does that just take time. They just take time. I want you to, this, there's a passage in Romans 12.10. It says, be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. That's the Passion Translation. And I love it because what that word really means in Greek is let's have reciprocal tenderness towards one another. And I think we live in a culture that has lost the ability to show kindness in a lot of ways. Kindness. Tenderness. And, and I want to tell you, because... because I, there's, there's one immutable law, it seems like, outside of God's design in marriage that I learned in other contexts, a lot of times if I'm right, then I win. I'm good. But you know, in marriage, even if, you, if you're right, sometimes you don't win. It's better to be kind than right sometimes. <laughs> Please come back next week. <laughs> There's just something to being kind and, 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 and in loving tenderness, being devoted, being committed to one another. Uh, and so there will be times where you fight harder for it than they do. That doesn't mean you cash it in, you walk away from the table, you, you, you cash out. It means that, that you dig deep. The grass is usually greener where you water it, right? Right? So you, you, pour some, you pour some love on that thing. Number two, uh, I'll just say this. The requirement on your forgiveness will always typically outweigh the, <laughs> the resource of your desire. The requirement on your forgiveness in marriage will often outweigh the resource of your desire. Meaning that the requirement of forgiveness, and by the way, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer here today, this will make less sense to you. But, but there'll be an opportunity at the end for you to get it. But the reality is, is that forgiveness was never an option. It was never an option. I can give you the parable of Jesus and the wicked servant, the one that didn't forgive. I can give you all that. I can give you other, other contexts. But the reality is that, that, that forgiveness was never optional, which is tough. And forgiveness is layered. Sometimes I have to confess forgiveness and then mean it later. You know? It's okay to lie about forgiveness initially, I think. <laughs> I forgive him, Lord. No, you don't, you idiot. I do, I do, and I'll mean it later. I really will. And you let God change your heart in it. But the reality is that, that very often, you, you know, you're not gonna feel it. The resource of your love, you're gonna go, gosh, you know, I love this person, but I don't love them that much. I'm just being real. Just being real. And, and what I've had to learn is that, that the Bible says that there are times where that person is not who you're going to cast that weight on. Let's, let, let's figure it out. I love this verse. It's a great one. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. All of you. Everybody say all of you. Come on, speak to me, church. Say all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility. <laughs> Yikes. 
Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Mm. I don't want his opposition. I want his grace. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Listen, here's the, here's, here's, here's the secret. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Sometimes you can't do that on your spouse. Sometimes when, 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 when you got to forgive them, you, you, you can't tell them how much you don't want to. You got to go to God with it. You got to cast some stuff on him. And, and, and let me tell you this. If you were never enough with him, then you'll never be enough with them. Whew, that was good. I'm going to say that again. If you, were never enough, if you were never enough with him, then you will never be enough with them. The reality is that if you don't have it right with him from the beginning, then, then there will be times in your marriage where it will pull on something that you don't have. And you're going to have to go to him to get it. That's a fact. And so, so, so I haven't learned too much in 21 years, but I've learned that. And that is that there are times when I've got to cast it on him because she ain't going to take it. She's going to look at me and she's going to bat it right back and, 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 and let me know exactly where I can go. To my prayer closet. I don't know what you were thinking she was going to say. But the reality is we have to cast something and God invites you to do that. Aren't you happy that there's a God in heaven that invites you to cast all of your junk on him? There's no one else in all of creation that it would invite you to do that. That would say, hey, give me all your complaining, your whining, your, your inadequacies, your insecurities, your garbage, your sin, your anger, your bitterness, your unforgiveness, and throw that on me. I'll be happy to take it so that you can love them the way I love you. I'm just going to leave that one with you. I think that preaches itself, doesn't it? That scripture. That scripture. Humility. Freedom. The, 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 the first definition of humility is freedom from pride or arrogance. To put others first. See, I think what, what, what good marriages, couples in good marriages know, is that sometimes you have to throw things on God. Not at each other. Even when you can't throw them at each other. You throw them on God. It's a race towards... This is another one that I think is important. This third principle. Marriage has always been a race towards selflessness. It's a race towards selflessness. And, and, and I want to talk with you for a minute about hopes, dreams, and desires. I've said this before. When you go into marriage, regardless of whether you realize it or not, you, you have hopes you have dreams you have desires you might say we're starting out in a shack right now but i've got a dream of a better home you might say we're we're starting out you know but w with just two of us but i've got a dream that we're going to fill this house right you might and you might have hopes dreams and desires everybody does that but but in many ways to the other person they can, those can feel like expectations my hopes, my dreams, my desires can feel like expectations to Amy. And, and, and very often, all of my hopes, dreams, and desires come from what I've seen and what I've heard, which is my experience. And so my experience shapes my hopes, my dreams, my desires, what I saw. And, and, and very often, what we've experienced often drives us to either avoid or recreate our past experiences. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? When you grew up in mom and dad's house, you said, I will never do it that way. Or you said, man, I want it just like that or you, you, whatever it might be. But, but your hopes, dreams, and desires were shaped by what you saw, by what you heard, your experience. And all of those hopes, dreams, and desires come into this big box called expectations. And, and what I've known about people 
is they don't like expectations. Because, and, and I'll tell you why. Because when both of you have different expectations that collide, a few things happen. Number one, people, when that takes place, when I can't meet all those hopes, dreams, and expectations over time, a lot of times people leave. They take all of that into their very next relationship. They didn't meet them, so I'm going to find somebody that did. Uh, the other thing, which is popular, is very often when that happens, they either leave or sometimes they win. And winning is difficult because winning looks like I'm going to convince the other person to meet all of my hopes, dreams, and desires, my expectations. It sounds like something like this when we convince somebody to do that. I realize that you always did this, but you're wrong. You have a bad box. I have a good box, right? Please embrace what's in my box. My hopes, my dreams, my desires. They're good. A lot of times, if we can't convince them, we'll try to convict them. I can't believe you would. How could you? Sound familiar? No, nobody. Just me. I know. I know. It's just me. Just preaching myself. Other times, we'll try to control. We'll try to control to help that person understand that our hopes, dreams, and desires, our expectations, or what they should be spending their life trying to fulfill. Or we may even coerce. And the, the person that wins is usually happy. He's doing a lot better, you know. He's really coming along, making progress. But the reality is, it doesn't make for strength in the relationship. It makes for resentment. Third thing we might do is conform. We become someone we're not to compensate for somebody who won't love us, won't accept us for who we are. We abandon who we are in order to make someone else happy regardless of whether or not it works for us. The temperature goes down in the relationship. The tension goes down but you're not really satisfied. And anyone who gives up who they are to become someone that they're not for someone else in the relationship, ultimately they lose respect for themselves and their partner loses respect for them too. Just the reality. Last thing a lot of times we'll do is we'll compromise. Fulfill my hopes, my dreams, my desires. Many of us believe that this is how we stay married. We've even called it a good thing. You may have had parents that weren't happy, but they weren't unhappy. Right? In a compromise, everyone keeps score, though. It's contractual. You know, well, I did this, so you do... Right? In this relationship, in a compromising relationship, there's always really low trust, though. Right? There's always low trust. And if there's low trust, there's, there's low intimacy. And low intimacy means that... that that sex and all the things that God created in marriage aren't fulfilling. And so you look elsewhere. You can't really give yourself fully to someone you don't fully trust. You just can't do it. Because trust has to imply safety. And, and no healthy relationship exists without safety and trust. So the goal in these kinds of relationships is I don't want to be taken advantage of. A compromised relationship is fueled to the wrong thing. It's fueled to a commitment to the relationship. Some people say, I'm committed to marriage. And that sounds good, but no one marries marriage. You married a person. You're committed to a person. You're committed to God's design for your marriage. You're committed to him. You're committed to his word. We're not committed to just the relationship. There's a person in it. So, so here's what I would tell you if you're dealing with any of this. Expectation is the killer of gratitude. Expectation is the killer of gratitude. Gratitude says, I didn't expect that and I'm thankful for it. Gratitude, gratitude is an indication, right? That, that I've not filled up the box of, of expectations. Because, because otherwise, I'm in a debt-debtor relationship, right? 
And that, that debt debtor relationships eliminate the possibility of unconditional love. And love needs margin. Love needs, hey, you decided to buy me flowers today. I wasn't expecting that. Right? Love has to have margin to be expressed. It's why God put a tree in the Garden of Eden that wasn't a good one. He knew that love needed margin and that it had to be selflessly chosen. So if every tree is good, what choice do Adam and Eve really have? It's kind of robotic, isn't it? Nobody, nobody said, well, I'm glad that you were the last person on earth. I choose you. <laughs> I'm glad that you were the only man living in the state of Virginia. I choose you. Feels special when you're like, man, out of all these people, and all the people, and all the places, and all the world, you chose me. Love doesn't do well without margin, church. You eliminate the potential for love to be recognized and expressed through, ex through expectation. It feels like pressure every single day of the week. So what do we do with our hopes, dreams, and desires? We cast them on God. What, what good marriages know is that people, they're owed nothing. And that they can expect nothing. But they also know that they're to give everything and expect nothing in return. That what I do, um, you know, is I give without expectation. Now we know in a marriage covenant that there are certain things that we follow biblically. And, and there were 630 laws, over 630 that the Jews had to abide by. And the law of Moses. And Jesus reduces them down to two. He, took, he takes 630 and makes them into two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself as I have loved you, then he really goes down to one, right? As I have loved you, love one another. Marriage then becomes a submission competition. I'm competing to prefer the other person. A race to the back of the line. Ephesians 5, 2 says, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us that's God's design in marriage and a lot of times we'll jump into it and go we love each other we'll figure it out in what other scenario in your life has that really worked you know they make you take driver's ed to drive a car you ever thought of that I mean, it's a pretty important task. You're going to use it every day of your life. You're wholly committing your life fully to another person. We might want to prepare for that one. Other people might be dependent on that preparation down the line. You might have kids. And all of these things are so important and so vital. And so what I would encourage you to do is never stop learning and never stop growing in your marriage. Don't put it on autopilot. Don't cash it in. For all the people who've been married 60 years, we, we had some couples married 60 years, we got some couples married 50 years, and all, all the way down. And for all of you who, who aren't married yet, make a choice to grow every day in the things of God. Because happy couples know that it is a race to the back of the line. It's a race to prefer one another. Something else I think that's important. Learning to cheer is far more difficult, but way more rewarding than living to boo. Learning to cheer is far more difficult, way more rewarding 
than living to boo. I want to say this word, encouragement. Say it with me. Say encouragement. How do you know if someone needs encouragement? If they're breathing. That's how you know. I've never looked at somebody that gave me encouragement and said, man, I just, you, I didn't need that today. I did not need that today. I'm like, please give me some more. <laughs> Die in there. <laughs> you think I'm doing a good job? <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Discover creative ways to encourage others. I love that. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. Isn't that good? This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together. Come on, somebody. As some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently. Amen to that. Post, you know. How many remember uh, right, out, right out of COVID? We're, we're everybody. I've never seen people more excited to be at church. Amen. <laughs> I think I missed you. It only took 18 months. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning the day of Jesus Christ's return. So, so if you think about it, you know why they play the, su play the Super Bowl in a neutral field? So there's no advantage. Statistically, every home team by sport has a vast advantage over the other team. Who's your squad here? The church. Where's home field advantage? The house of God. These are, the, these are your teammates. And if you think about it, you come here not to get beat down, but to be encouraged in truth and in love. To say, hey, you know, you're off, but that's okay. We've been there. Let's get you right. Let's help you. You're killing it. You're doing a good job. Come on. You can do this. God has it in you to do this. Let's find creative ways to encourage one another until we see the day approaching. So home field advantage means that you automatically, in every situation, in every trial, we already know Jesus bought and paid for our victory with, with the shed blood on the cross and his resurrection. So we're more than conquerors. But sometimes you need reminding of that. You need to be reminded of that. You need to be reminded that you can do it, that you can win, that you're not a loser, that you're not a failure, that, there's good, that, that, that good things are going to come, that God's plans for you are good and loving. You know when the price is wrong for all of you who are looking to be married? I'll give you Job's wife. Job's at the worst point of his life. He's lost everything. He's laying down sick. And here's his wife's advice to him. I want you to hear it. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. He started snapping. He was a first snapper. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. I don't know about you, but who do you want in your foxhole? How important is encouragement in your life? You need it most when you're worst. <laughs> if you think about encouragement, you need it most when you're at your worst. Not to go in the same bad direction you're going but to let God do something different. Can, can I just tell you that I believe that Satan has weakened the people of God by convincing them that they shouldn't be in a seat in his house. The very fact that you as a married couple are sitting in that chair statistically means that you have a 50% better chance of staying happily married just by showing up. 
said this last week, but it's so important. Building healthy spiritual rhythms and habits. You might have fought on the way here. You might, you might fight on the way home. But God was present in your marriage in this place. And you know what? If you build a habit of running to Him in every season then there might be somebody that says, you should come to the small group for marriage. <laughs> and you might go, I'm tired of fighting, you're probably right. <laughs> and you might do it. And you never know what you could learn and how you can grow. Remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble people are always learning people. They know how to receive. They know how to submit. They know how to say, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to listen. Don't get to the point where you're unwilling to listen. Jesus said they'll ever be hearing but never perceiving, right? They're never listening, never understanding. They're always, they'll see, but they'll never, they'll never really perceive. They'll hear, but they'll never really understand. They, what that meant is they're so prideful, they're so hard-hearted that I'm standing right in front of them and they don't recognize me. Jesus wants to show up in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships. Happy couples know it's a race to the back of the line. And I want to encourage you. There might be one thing. What I really felt the Holy Spirit speak to me in worship today was there's some of you who are probably in a really rough patch. And, and you should come up and get prayer. You should say, hey, we don't know how to do this on our own. And we don't have to. God gave us an amazing church that loves us, believes in us. It's going to encourage us. We're going to find creative ways to encourage us. There's other people in here I felt like the Lord said, um, you need to come up and surrender the relationship. Leave it to him. Some things only he can do. Would you bow your heads with me today? I want our prayer team to come up. And I want you to know we're here to pray for every single thing that you might have need of. Healing. Our God is a healer. By his stripes we're healed. Maybe you're in a season in your marriage, your family, your relationship. Maybe you need to get, if you're dating and it's toxic, you need to get out. God wants to give you the courage to do that. If you're married, he wants to give you hope today. I'm going to pray for marriages and then I want to invite another category of people for prayer. Dear God, for all the people that you spoke to me about, those that just thinking, of, man, maybe I should just throw in the towel. Maybe I just should, should give up. I just pray hope right now. I pray your grace right now. Father, I pray right now that you would meet them in their time of need. Encourage and strengthen them. So many layers, God. You know how to peel back every one. Father, I pray for those who just need to surrender that relationship to you. Let you speak into it and do what you need to do. God, what you've put together, let no one separate. Father, I thank you for marriage. I thank you that it's a reflection of your love for your church. I thank you that you designed it. You defined it. God, it's yours. And we honor you with it. And I pray blessing over every marriage here. I'm so thankful for this amazing church. And I pray your grace on it. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and something applies or something doesn't, but you're on the outside looking in. You've never, maybe you believe in God. We're in the Bible Belt. A lot of people do, but you've never actually personally surrendered to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Find forgiveness of sin. If you're online today or you're in these chairs, I want to invite you into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We all have sin and it separates us from God and we're all doomed to hell without him. Heaven is real, hell is real, it's all real. And one day we're gonna stand before him and he's gonna ask us what we did with his son. What did you do with Jesus? Did you accept him? 
Did you accept the grace, the covering? A perfect sacrifice paying for an imperfect person. Dirt can't clean dirt. We need Jesus. We have sin and it separates us and condemns us. But God loves us and the encouragement is we can find abundant and eternal life through him. And today I want to invite you. Maybe you've been far from God. I want to invite you to come home today. Hope Point is going to help you. Our whole church is going to say this prayer with you. And at the end of it, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to call you up, call you out, but I'm going to ask you to acknowledge that. And we're going to cheer for you like you just won the Super Bowl. Say this prayer with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of my sin. I turn from it and I turn to you. Today, Jesus, I give you my life. I make you my Lord and Savior. I accept the grace that you showed me when you died on the cross, paying a price I couldn't. And when you rose again, conquered death and hell, you gave me abundant and eternal life. So I receive it now and commit to serve you, commit to follow you all my days. Thank you for cleaning me up, giving me a new start. In Jesus' name, amen.